I wasn't down on myself. It wasn't about that. It was just, I was just PTSD from all the stress and trauma. And, but I did a good job. I did what I could. And, and what happened happened wasn't bad. It was good we moved actually. Welcome to Beyond the Fail, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. On this week's episode, we delve into the captivating journey of Jeanne Amlor, a former actress and a leadership recruiter, and now business strategist, seven-figure online business coach, and certified leadership executive coach. This episode is a raw and honest exploration of failures and overcoming multiple setbacks. Sean takes us through the highs and lows of her career, including starting a business as a single parent, to having to close down her business during a challenging divorce, accumulating substantial debt, and then taking the calculated risks that led her to pivot her business, resulting in an impressive £1 million in revenue in just 17 months. Her story is one of resilience and redemption. Join us as we unravel the layers of Jean's journey, discovering the transformative power of enduring hardships, the significance of gratitude, and the strategic decisions that paved the way for both her achievements and her tribulations. Get ready for an episode brimming with inspiration, authenticity, and the unwavering spirit of a business leader who faced failure head on, emerged stronger and ultimately thrive. This is Beyond the Foul with Jeanne Malore. Jeanne, um, great to have you here, um, all the way from the US of A. Um, thank you for being here. Where did it all start for you in business? Uh, well, it started when I became a newly solo parent of two very young children. Um, I was in New York. I was, you know, I had no money. And I thought, well, I, I have to figure, I had a little bit of money, but I had to figure out how do I take care of my kids as an attachment parent and survive? So I realized I had to get into business. And the first thing I did was I had a kid's fashion blog, which you probably didn't know. And the good thing about that was people loved it. And people were like, wow, I love your blog. And I was like known around the world in the kid's fashion blogging a lifestyle blogging within three months. I thought, wow, this is great. But I couldn't really monetize it that well. However, it did get me blogging and meeting people. And I got a lot of free, good designer clothes. Did you start kids. that blog out of uh, passion or was that your business idea? That was both. I thought, hmm, I've got this idea and I'm going to do this kids blog. So I, I was a designer and I was into kids stuff and fashion and art and all that. And it, it worked. People loved it. And it was, I was excited about it. And people were like, I love your blog. And I thought I was going to monetize it. I did get some advertising, but it was not enough to create a real business out of it. But it did get me out there. I met a lot of people, got me writing content, and it got me confidence because I had no confidence at that point in myself. So it, it served a lot of purposes. However, then I thought, well, wait a minute. I'm not making money. I got to do something else. What is that? And I thought, hmm, I've always been good at coaching. I looked into it, I thought, yes, I've always wanted to be a coach. And now that I have a very, and my life is, um, you know, aligned because I was on my, you know, on my, on my own bat now, you know, I thought I could do this now. I'm not a fake. So I started off as a life coach and I, I became certified at night when the kids were sleeping. And then one of my friends who was a mom, I saw her in a park, like, you know, we were pl the kids were playing and I said, oh, guess what? I'm a life coach. She goes, well, who's your, who's your business coach? And I said, huh? She goes, who's your business coach? I said, I need a business coach. She goes, of course you need a business coach. Just because you are saying you're a life coach, where are your clients? I thought, oh, she's right. So I, I didn't waste a minute. So I, I did get a, a coach. And she goes, I could coach. I said, no, I want your coach. Okay. <laughs> and she went, oh, smart. <laughs> so I, I hired her coach and I was paralyzed with fear, like just paralyzed. And the coach was like, I, of course, I've got two kids in New York City just starting this. No, hardly any money coming in. It's hard in New York City. It's not like hard. What was that oh, fear? Gosh. It was just a fear. You know what it is? It's the fear, the classic fear. And they had interviewed a lot of women. 
And the interesting thing is a lot of women have this fear of being a bag lady on New York City streets. And a lot of those people don't even live in New York. And it's hilarious that they have, they have actually interviewed a lot of women who are successful. And the deepest fear is that we're going to lose everything and be like a bag lady on the streets of New York. And then the joke is some of those women don't even live in New York. So they're somehow going to make their way to New York and be a bag lady. <laughs> no, no, I lived in New York. So my greatest fear was that we would be on social security. Yeah. And like, so, you know, government, like social security, like, you know, I, I'm not against people being on social security, but it's not me. Um, no, it was just like, what what will happen? You know, like, what if we have no money? We are going to be on social security. I don't want to be on social security because then I've lost. That was my fear. Then I've lost because I'm, I'm just a social security person. No. So that was my fear that that, that would happen. So and then, of course. The deeper fear when you when I started thinking about it, I thought, well, yeah, I do have this deep fear of being like, you know, a homeless on the streets of New York as a bag lady. And as I said, that's not an uncommon fear. OK, so then I started getting clients. I was in my pajamas and I was getting clients because I asked everybody, you know, like, do you know anybody that might need my help? And some of my friends were like, yeah, I think you'd be a great, great life coach. I started getting clients and immediately the very first client I got, I was helping them with their business. So it wasn't life coaching. Okay. It was life and business immediately because mm. I'm really creative about marketing. And I didn't know that. And my coach said, well, you're a business coach. She goes, you're a business coach. It's just natural. So I then was calling myself a life and business coach. So that's how I got started. Well, just just out of interest, because I always find the word life coach. And, and I think they're, all, they're often used interchangeably as well. I think if people think, you know, because I've, I've had coaches and mentors, but they've always been around the business sense. But if I actually mention to some of my friends about I've got a coach, I, some I th people think that that is actually a life coach. How do you define the difference? Well, there, life coaching isn't business coaching, actually. It's not. Life coaching. Now, the thing is, most people don't say I'm a life coach because that's kind of old-fashioned. Now it's, <clears throat> I help men to navigate you know their relationships better so it's still life coaching but now people are more used to be that they did everything like we're going to sort your life out now you still could find a general life coach but generally people tend to specialize in something like either they're going to help some help men and women or they're like a spiritual life coach or they're a relationship coach or they're a career coach or they're you know a fitness health and emotional coach so Anything that's not business and has to do with personal stuff is a form of life coaching. But you are correct that in my business coaching, I am throwing some life coaching in there, but I'm not focusing on fixing their relationships. I'm not. I'm definitely not. It is life coaching, but what is always in there is mindset coaching. Of that's that's the given. Yeah. But I am not a life coach. Yeah. Not anymore. And you said that you'd done sort of coaching before or enjoyed coaching. Where where had you kind of had the experience of doing it before? Uh, oh, I, I used to be an actress. Right. And I was also, I was an actress. And I was really good at coaching actors. And I thought, I'm very good at coaching actors because I used to just informally help my friends. And I thought, you know, I'm going to charge for this. So when I was working in New York for Wall Street, I had a side gig for fun and I would get you know clients here and there and I would coach them on their auditions and that I loved it they got I, I got this young woman into LaGuardia which is really hard to get into it's this performing arts school and she had tried four times and I got her in on the fourth try and she called and she she called me and she cried she goes it's because of you I got into my top school so she was uh, and that oh I just got goosebumps and that I felt so great Oh my gosh, I really helped somebody with such a great feeling. So I remembered that and I thought, well, I do like helping people. I'm a helper. That's my thing. I'm a helper. I want to help people thrive in every single way possible. And I thought, this is so rewarding. Somebody's on, um, I changed her life to get into that school. Changed her life. She said, we couldn't get in. My mom hired you. She said, I think this woman's going to get you in. And I did. And you know what? When I, this is a long time ago. She got in about the same time that 9-11 happened. Right. And I remember, I want to cry now, she left me a message on my um, 
answering machine. And she said, Sean, stop. I know you don't probably care about this with everything going on, but you got me into LaGuardia and I'm so happy. And she was like, no, things are terrible. And you probably don't care because it was a 9-11. She goes, but I care that I got into the school. She goes, no, and she's right. Life had to go on. And it was a weird time because she's thanking me, but then she's sort of like apologizing that she's caring even about the school. I'll never forget that message. Mm, very, very, very poignant, I'm sure. Yeah. And you mentioned that you you were working in Wall Street. So did you have corporate experience? Because obviously if you're doing business coaching, mm. did you, you know, have, have experience in, in kind of, you know, business and, and corporate settings to be able to then coach at that level? Well, actually, I hadn't had marketing your business, building a business. I had had really good sales training because I was a top executive recruiter on Wall Street, right. and that is sales. Yeah, It's like chess because you're selling something to somebody that doesn't even want it and doesn't even know that they even want to move at the highest levels. I was doing I, – I was I – was, recruiting like portfolio managers and analysts. And then I was recruiting investment bankers. And a lot of them, they didn't want to move. They're like, I'm making so much money. I don't want to do this. And I'm like, yeah, but, but, you know, we should talk because, and they're like, okay, I'll have the conversation. But it was a really kind of like selling to people that really, some might want to move, but I'm good. Okay, sure. I'll have the conversation. It's really like chess back and forth. Even get them to talk to you. So that was good because it got me I already had, was dealing with rejection every single day of my life as an actress. So I didn't care if they rejected me with that. I was like, oh, yeah, sure. But it's really good because you don't take it personally. You get a very thick skin. It's like, yep, okay, fine. And I just I just did the reps. And that taught me just to not attach any personal stories to it. Like, you're just doing the reps. You're calling them. You're following up. And it's just numbers. Of course, you're using your, your words and persuasion and you know, you're not a robot, but the reps are robotic and you're just doing the reps. Yep. So I learned a lot about that, not, not placing my emotions of, oh, they didn't like me. They didn't get back to me. So what? Call again, <laughs> you know, follow up again. I mean, that is, can be quite, I'm sure, disheartening and quite grueling really to have that rejection, especially on a because recruiting is about personal relationships, right? And yeah, that, I'm sure that's... Yeah, that was, was that really hard. difficult at the beginning? Nope, not at all. To be honest, nope, not at all. What was difficult was being an actress and your whole being and who you are and your talent and your personality and what you look like and your voice. That is hard. So you, That's personal. You would basically got the grounding to be really resilient through your acting career. Yes, because this was not personal. This was business. This was, do you want the job or not? No. It's nothing to do with Jeanne Amalur. But it's hard for actors to say it's nothing to do with Jeanne Amalur. Yes, of course it is. <laughs> it's, it's totally everything to do with your voice, your height, your weight, what you look like, your talent, everything, how you're interpreting it, blah, blah, blah. It's all about rejecting the whole person with acting. There is no doubt about that. Yeah. And that's, yeah, do you know what? I would have never thought of how acting and the experience of of that and 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 build a, trying to build a career could have given you that level of resilience to be able to go into a challenging sales job and then it not affect you at all not at all in fact it was quite funny this is the this is very strange when i got the job i knew nothing about wall street i i was just a complete artist like I lived in a, a garret in Paris with no heating you know at with no no bathroom I used to walk 12 feet to a Turkish fountain which is just cold water and then the WC okay and I would go downstairs to my friend's place to take a shower yeah. and but I knew nothing I nothing about business or I was you know, flaky with business I was just an artist right and I answered this ad and I left a voice and I, I, I had a very international accent at that point because I'd lived in Paris and he's like, this woman's cultured and she's, you know, he's like, okay. And I left a voice because he, he had a, an ad and I said, okay, I'm, and he goes, oh, he's like, please come in. We really want to interview you. We really, okay. So I go, okay. And I, I had to buy a suit 
for that mm-hmm. interview. Like, go to this cheap place called Strawberry, which has cheap suits. And I buy a suit because I was broke as heck. I, when I turned up to New York, I had about 100 bucks. I was one, that person that was an immigrant to my own country because I was born in America, but I grew up in Australia, so I didn't even have a social security number. So I was an immigrant to my own country. It's kind of bizarre. And I had about 100 bucks, okay? And I was staying with friends, and I was like, I better get a job soon, and just cobbling that together, staying in Brooklyn with a rat, in a rat-infested apartment. I was like, oh, I wasn't sleeping very much, so I turned up to this bleary-eyed with this new cheap suit on, okay? And the guy starts explaining to me what it is, and I'm like, uh-huh, mm-hmm, executive recruiting, yep. Mm-hmm. I'm just so tired I can hardly hear him. He goes, do you know what that is? I said, yeah, I do. I said, my sister used to be a recruiter just for managers. He goes, oh, well, this is much. I said, yeah, I get it. I said, you know what? I don't know what a stock or a bond is. I said, I don't know if I'm your person. And he's like, what? No, I'll teach you. I said, oh, yeah, really? I said, I don't know. I just, I'm very scrupulous. I said, I don't know. I just really want to do a good job. And he's he's just dying here because he, there's this actress who's, he wants to offer this, it was like how many hours a week? I think it was 30 hours a week or something like that. And he's like, what? But, but he goes, but, but you're great for this. I said, really? I don't know about Wall Street. He goes, what? And he says to himself, he goes, this is like a Seinfeld episode. Yeah. He turns away. He goes, this is like a Seinfeld episode. And he goes, look, yeah. are you trying to talk me out of hiring you for this job? He said that to me. I said, not really. He's like, what? I said, really? I said, I just want to really do a good job. He goes, you will. You're good. You're fine. You're hired. I said, okay. It was hilarious. That's amazing. It was like this. It was like a skit, okay. And he's like thinking this, and then he laughed. He chuckled. He goes, "You're hired." Or a brilliant sales tactic on you to reverse, like you know, reverse psychology in, into giving you that job. Well, yeah, it was just he was like forcing me. To, and he goes, "Look, you're going to be great." He goes, "You have the best voice I've ever heard." He goes, "I love your voice. They're going to love your voice." And he said, "It's very cultured. It's intelligent. It's worldly." You know, it's perfect for the Wall Street people. And he goes, and you are going to be the best executive recruiter I've ever met in my life. And I said, you think? (laughs) I didn't say you think because I didn't know that colloquialism then. I said, oh, really? And he went, yes. So he goes, I'm going to teach you everything. So after a week, after Chinese whispers, because I didn't know what I was saying, he'd just like say this. And I'd like, okay. And I had a script. See, I had a script. I'm an actress. I had a script. I'm good. He goes, there's a script. You are. And he only hired actors. And he says to me at the end of the week, he goes, okay, you are the most talented executive recruiter I've ever met in my entire life and you're a natural. And I said, really? He goes, yes. It wasn't hard for me at all. It was just learning, you know, his calling techniques of where to write stuff and putting the post, you know, things like that. And I said, yeah, it wasn't hard. And only one person ever figured out that I didn't know what what the heck I was talking about. This, this guy, he said, you don't know what you're talking about. I said, no, I don't. Could you please explain that? And he said, sure. <laughs> and why, why, why did he say you were natural? And why did you find it easy? Was it because you were just literally following the scripts and putting on a persona? It was just not hard for me to talk to people and say these things. And I, I had no, the first call was hard. I thought, oh, I got to call somebody I don't know. And then after, you know, two or three, I thought, oh yeah, I'm good. It was just, it was just to me a system. I didn't take it personally because it wasn't my acting. It was just, just do it. And um, I enjoyed talking to the people too. And I liked the conversations and, you know, it was fun because I was like, oh, I'm this Wall Street person. And of course, after you know a month or two, I did know what I was talking about. Mm. And then of course, I, I was learning more about it. And then I could, you know, ad lib more, you know, but it was really funny to me. I thought it was, I thought it was fascinating that I had a script and I didn't know what I was talking about. I was just words. But I said them so convincingly. I did my job as an actress <laughs> that, you know, they say a good actor can read out the telephone book is, and it's interesting. And I thought, here it is. It's like the telephone book because it's not it's the hardest acting gig ever, you know, as you say, to, yeah. to make anything sound interesting. It was just a job. It was way easier than, you know, learning an audition piece. That's for sure. Mm. And, and standing up in front of strangers and trying to get a role. It was a piece of cake. So it was the only thing in my life that I did not have to try to be good at. The only thing that I did not have to try to be good at. I was astounded that I didn't have to try so hard to be good at something. 
And what success did you see in your in that job over time? Oh, I mean, I hired more people than anybody else at every single job I had. Hands down. In fact, at the last job I had, I, I hired five investment bankers in one and a half years. That is unheard of because right. they're long game. And all together, the whole other team of recruiters, and I think there are like another seven or so, hired one all between them. Right. And I hired five on my own. There, there's the numbers for you. Because these are high end. These are retained jobs. These are not like we had the contract. Does that make sense? Mm. Why else did that teach you then being in that environment? It was, um, well, I liked that it was sort of corporate. I thought, okay, this is, even though they, they're pretty easy going. I mean, I always negotiated my own hours. I always negotiated four or three days because I wanted to keep my acting in my life. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to give up my life. Do you want to hire me? You know, and they're like, yeah, we do. We want to hire you. And I said, great. Um, I want to work three days a week. And they said, okay, just so you do the work. I'm, I will. And everybody was like, wait, you're working three days a week? And I said, yep. Yeah. We're working five. I said, wait, are you an actress? Do you want to work three? Ask them. Maybe they'll let you. They said, no, they will definitely not let us. I said, well, these are my terms. And they were like, well, yeah, we want you. And I perform when people, you know, give me a little bit of freedom. Absolutely. And it's, and, you know, it sounds like you obviously highly valued given that they basically gave you what you wanted. Yeah. And going back to your coaching business, which you then went on to to start uh, later on, and you talked a lot about kind of the the fear of starting that. Did you have any other support from from anyone else apart from that coach? Did you have like family support? What did your family think of of you going into um, you know business? Actually, my family lived in Australia, right. and most of them do. So I didn't have any family support. It was maybe like, hey, I'm doing some coaching. Oh, okay. You know, but it was really just the coach and, and my friends like, oh, that's great. Yeah, do that. But I didn't have a lot of support and I didn't seek a lot of support because I was so busy taking care of my two children that the bandwidth is so tiny that you're not like, oh, who am I going to ask for support? You're just like, it's just every day you're just up and you're working, taking care of the kids. There is no room for doubt or wallowing or anything like that. You're just putting in all the reps for every single thing you're doing. So I wasn't like, gee, I need some support. It was like, got to get the coach. Just do it. Just do it. So I'm just thinking how you got through that that period and, and you said that, you know, the fear was quite intense. I'm just thinking how did you manage to, to overcome that? What I did, and actually it's an interesting question. My coach said, I have never experienced this level of fear with a client ever and she'd been coaching 10 years okay wow 10 years and she said and i get it because that must be pretty darn scary because she had been from new york and new jersey that you're in new york with two children with a very uncertain future at your age because i was 46 at that point okay um and yeah for 46 40, 46 47 and she said so i get it she said, I have never seen, she goes, well, what's fascinating about you? She goes, you take the action anyway. So that's what I did is I just waded through the fear and I dragged the fear behind me. I just thought, I'm not going to stop it. It's fearful. Yes. And I'm just going to take action anyway. And I just dragged the fear behind me as I took action. And that has been my strategy is, okay, I'm fearful. Don't overthink it. You're fearful. Okay, take action anyway. You're fearful. Okay, take action anyway. Sitting around trying to figure out your fears and get past them does not work. You need to drag your fears behind you. And the way I saw it visually was this. I saw myself like this plane in the runway with the two wings I'm trying to take off. And on the wings are all these fears like laden is a good word that came to my mind. Laden with fears. And my thing was, okay, do I stay here in the runway or do I get the plane going slowly and then take off? Uh, and then at that point, you're in the air. It means you're doing stuff and the fears peel off because you're already taking action. Therefore, there is nothing to be afraid of because you've, by action, overcome the fears without even realizing it. Mm, nice analogy. Nice. 
the fact that your coach said that they, that is the highest level of fear they'd ever seen in any client, how mm-hmm. how did that manifest? How did it manifest in my life? Yeah. Well, I mean, I just felt it. I Oh, I was in a state of anxiety and stress, you know. Mo- it was emotional, obviously. It was just the anxiety and the stress and the fear. It was like, okay, I, I got to get through this. I just got, I just, ha- I just have to take action. I just have to figure out, do what she says. And I started getting clients. So, you know, it worked. It was just, when you're in a stressful situation, you need to just cope the best you can. It might not mean that the stress is going to leave. And I couldn't spend time, you know, to go get stress reduction classes again. I was changing diapers and feeding kids and, you know, taking them to their classes in the park every day because we're in New York City and trying to work while I was at the park and, you know, get them on their play dates and take care of my children because I always did. My kids always went to classes. I spent all of my money on classes for my children. That was the main budget because I was homeschooling them a bit later. And we were going to homeschooling classes and I was, you know, doing stuff while they were in classes and they had play dates and parties. And my kids had a great life while I was going through all this on purpose because I never, ever wanted to say, oh, we had to sacrifice anything for them. Nothing was sacrificed at all. So I had zero guilt because somewhere in my mind, I knew I was going to get past it. And I thought when I get past it and make more money. I don't want to say, oh, I wish I'd not, I wish I'd spent more money on them then. So I, I just did. I just put it on credit and I thought, this, they went to the best classes. They were studying chess at Marshall Chess with world chess masters. They were yeah. taking the best science. Luckily, we lived in a very Greenwich village. All the classes were near there. And then we'd go to other co op classes and Central Park. And so they had, we had the YMCA like right across the street that had great lessons. And then, so it, we were centrally well, well located. And I had some babysitting help after a while. I'd have the babysitter take them out and go take them to the classes. So I was then carving out some of my day. Uh, I thought I have to get some time now. Um, and I would just pay the babysitter for three or four hours a day at some point. That's really interesting because on one hand, you've got this fear that you and your anxiety that you're essentially going to lose everything and end up homeless. Mm. But then on the other hand, you're supporting your kids and probably beyond your means at that point in time oh, to give them to give them the best life, which was kind of feels slightly contradictory. Well, it is. It is contradictory. And it wasn't like it was, you know, like exorbitant amounts of money. But for me, anything was a lot, right? And of mm. course I was good at budgeting and all that. No, but I thought I am not going to have my kids not have a great childhood because I'm not making a ton of money. You know, sometimes T- you know, taking them to play dates. It's, it's more time than money, yeah. right? It's Some of this was more time than money. It was a mix, actually. Um, but also, that's a contradiction as well, because if you're starting a business, you need your time, right? Yes. And you, so how did you, how, how, how did you fit your business? That's how a great did you question. Grow it? You know what I did? I had a first kind of coach that I like did group coaching with, and she said, you need to spend at least 25 hours on a business to build it. And I thought, oh, she's right. And I thought, okay, where am I going to get that 25 hours? And I thought, okay. And you know what I did for two solid years? I worked from 7 p.m. till midnight every weekday for two solid years. I never watched anything on Netflix. I was a beast because I understood the numbers. I thought, okay, from 7 till 7, I'm mom and I'm fitting stuff in where I can. Okay. And then... From 7 p.m. till midnight, I have five solid hours to work on my business, and I did that. So I got 25 hours in at night, and then I was tired. And then I was doing what I could here and there in the day. But I knew as soon as I got them to bed, and they were in bed asleep by 7, because my kids, my kids always had a really early bedtime, because I think children should, should sleep earlier than most people let them. And people were astounded that they would come. we would come home, at four, I said, I got to get him home for dinner. Like it's four. Yes. I knew I was really like, like the military. I knew exactly the numbers. We got to be home by four. We eat, we eat by four 30, take time, you know, bath, blah, blah, blah. Two of them read. I was read to them every single night. Okay. So I had certain things were non-negotiable eating early, get him settled down, bath, ready for bed, read in bed, asleep by seven. Like I don't mean in bed, yeah. asleep by seven. So at seven, 
I was still nursing. I would sneak out, close the doors, and I worked from seven till midnight. Sometimes there'd be a wake awakening and then I'd go and come back. So again, I was not willing to not read to them. And my daughters to this day tell me how much they love reading and they know it's because you read to us every single night and we had hundreds and hundreds of books. So that was, again, part of the budget was buying books. Okay, we went to the library too, but it's good to have books that are owned by the kids. We had so many books and that's important. So I, I, yes, that was the priority was I had to get the five hours. I was, I was very tired actually because I was then sleeping from midnight they would be up by like six. So I was, I, by the time I settled down, probably I fell asleep by 1230. I'd be up. So I was getting maybe six and a half hours sleep, which is not a lot for me at all. Mm. Um, and then there, usually there's something be another awakening. So I understood what a lot of people don't understand. And that is you need to work out your numbers. You need to work out exactly what you need to do to fit that in and not be in la la land. I thought, wait a minute, how am I going to build this a two hours a day, not going to happen. I tried to fit more time, of course, in. So then I was kind of getting seven hours in, you know, because sort of maybe fit an hour or two in here or there. So I was getting maybe six, you know. Then I didn't feel guilty. I thought, okay, I'm taking care of my kids in the day. That's fine. Tonight I'm working. And I would answer stuff too. So maybe it was like six a day when I look at it all together. And then after two years, I said to myself, I really need to do some entertainment. And I allowed myself to watch one (laughs) show per week. One show per week. And that was it. I'm going to watch this. It was Mad Men. (laughs) I'm going to watch this episode. And that's, and I would enjoy it. It was 45 minutes and I'd be like, okay, ah, this is my entertainment for the week. And that was it. Because I know how that eats your time up. I mean, that's some discipline. Well, it had to be. Over that, you know, over that course. Mm-hmm. And and did that have the positive impact on your business at that point well, in time? It, did. it gave me the, the time to, to start getting clients and I knew I need and I started, you know, just taking care of stuff and, and following up with people and this and the actual coaching I would do at night too, obviously, because I couldn't do it on the day. It had to be evening evening coaching only at that point. Then when I got the babysitter, I could do it some in the day as well. So it was really setting it up. And, and I didn't have a website at that point even. It was, I was in business for a whole year before I got a website. And then my, my coach was like, you really got to get this website. I said, okay, you know, because I knew that was going to be a hustle. So I thought I didn't, I, I only do what I have to do in my business because I, I don't go and do all the bells and whistles like most people do. I always understood, no, what's the highest impact action? It's following up with people. It's getting them on calls. It's, it's getting them as clients. It's not saying, oh, gee, I need to get a website or a Herman Miller chair or whatever, you know, um, mm. it, it was never that. I was very like, okay, very organized. And I became very good at productivity because of that. Just every minute counted because it had to. No, absolutely. And and that's a definitely a great story in 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 discipline and focus actually, that you managed to juggle full time, you know, parent, single parent with, you know, growing that business. And it was also it was also doing whatever it took. It was like, this is what it takes. I'm doing it. It wasn't, oh, that's so hard because I thought I have to build this business. That is the only way there's non-negotiable. This is non-negotiable. So what ended up happening to that coaching business? Okay. So that was getting, it was was growing and I actually got to my first 100K year, which was amazing with all the mothering going on and the fact I only worked Mm. about 25 hours a week, right? And but it, it was a hustle though. And then I was getting a little tiny bit of babysitting so I could go to these networking events at night. Not a lot. I try to go to maybe t- two a month, you know, and I get a babysitter and I wipe the avocado stain off and I put it, and I bought a nice Stella McCartney jacket that was like amazing because I wanted to buy one nice piece to, and, and, and I, you know, you buy a nice piece. So I bought this really expensive Stella McCartney sort of cool kind of businessy, but cool jacket. Okay. And I went out there and I'd be networking and it was, you know, I was tired, but I did it and then I'd get the cards and I realized that I had to do more networking. So I'd get babysitting for that. And I tried it. And then at one point I tried to go to maybe one, one, one a week, you know, and then I tried to build it up to like two and I got really good at the networking. It was a hustle though. And it was also a big hustle because I wasn't online. Okay. 
Now, did you? Sorry, j- just a question about that networking events because I think mm-hmm. it's an interesting topic. Uh, right. uh, essentially, what benefits did you see from that networking events? Did you get clients? Were they? Su- did. Was it successful? It was. Yes, I always got clients. It was the only way I could get clients at that point. It was just laborious because you go to the work networking event, you talk to a bunch of people, you figure out if any of them, this was when it was business coaching for all sorts of businesses. And then they talk with you, they like you. Hey, you know, here's my card. I had cards. I don't have a card now. Here's my card. Uh, and then I would, they'd give me their card and I'd follow up and you follow up. You, and I'd go home immediately. I would immediately right away say, hey, just met you. And go through them all. And I would look through them all and go, okay, no, not a fit. No, no, no. Yes, these people might actually need coaching from what I heard. I don't know. And I follow up with all of them right away. And I start the email follow-ups to get them on a call. Mm. Okay. Or or to I didn't want to meet. Some of them like, let's have a coffee. I'm like, oh, okay. You know what? That's like me dressing up, going out. So that was the whole thing. And I got to 100K a year working. It was amazing, but it was so hard. It was like very laborious going out. And the amount of people you can meet is limited. And then maybe they need coaching or not. It, it is amazing that I made. And then I started sponsor, being a sponsor at little events. And that worked really well because I had a table. And I was a ninja at those tables. Okay. I, I had chocolate there. I'd chat to them. I'd give them something free, like a free little laser like session right there. And they were right away getting coaching. And I was really good at those tables. Okay. Then... I was like, okay, I need to get online now. I knew that. And I had been kind of scared to get online because I was just not that confident about being online and having the whole world see me. But then I remember I said to a friend of mine, that's it. It's going better. I got a lot of confidence. I need to get this online now. And then the actual, I was already separated for four and a half years. Then the actual divorce happened, okay, which was really just the legal part. And that was the rupture really set me back because it was one and a half years in court, lots of being sued, lots of stuff went on. And that was scary. That was just, everything was sucked out of my, all that I, you know, everything I had made, saved, gone. We had to move to another city. Okay. We were kicked out of our home. Okay. Moved to another city where my brother lived and I'd start all over again in it a place where people didn't really invest in themselves because it wasn't New York City. New York City are people like, yeah, I love it. I love your energy. Sure, sure, sure. Here it's like, oh, there's a New Yorker in the Midwest. Yeah. And I did get some clients, but the, it, just where I moved was not like a high invest in yourself. It was like, I'm fine and it was really cheap to live there. So I had to start all over again and I, I massive networking. And I thought, ah, typical classic case of a great product in the wrong place. I'm good at what I do, but this this is not where I should be selling. So um, after two years of just, and also I, I was low in confidence because I was helping my kids like in this new place and taking care of them and going into deeper debt, actually. And we lived in a nice place. We had nice food. I want my kids to feel strain. But after two years, I thought, oh my gosh, I got to do something. And I got my mojo back because I was low in confidence after all that. And... Was that confidence um, not because of the everything that happened through the divorce? It was from all of that. It was from all of that. The court, I was worn out and I had PTSD and we moved and I was fine. I was fine, but I thought I do have dysthemia. It was like a low level. I looked fine though, you know, and I was really careful to take care of my mental health. But I thought, you know, I have to do something. And I woke up one, and I, oh, I got my mojo back and I had my first event in a long time and I was on fire. And I thought, I'm back. Okay, the event, I'm back. I'd gone to visit my family in Australia and that sort of healed me. And I, kind of, I thought, okay, I'm back. I got to start showing up again. I didn't want to because I was just healing. So I got back and that event was great. And I thought, oh, I'm just as powerful as I was before. Great. And then I thought, I got to get online. And I woke up one morning and I thought, oh gosh, what am I going to do? I have to get online because I'm failing here. Even though the event was good, it got me some clients, but I don't want to have to keep doing those events offline. I thought, this is not what I wanted. I wanted to get online a long time ago because I know that's the way to scale. I thought, okay, I'm ready to show up now because I was hiding. Okay. 
There was that too. I'm ready to hiding go from what? I was hiding just, just wanted to hide after everything. You just want to like, you know, heal. People aren't like, yeah, I want to be seen when you're getting past PTSD, right? And I did have PTSD. And then I got over it. And I thought, you know what? I'm good. I'm powerful. I'm back. But then I thought, I don't want to do that whole offline thing again. It's not working here. But the event, it was great. That that I want to do. And that was so hard to do the event. So I woke up one morning and I thought, I need to get online. And I need to find some coaching program. And I just need to plonk down. I know it's going to be about 10K because I know that that's how much they cost. And I found one. And I plonked down 10K on three different credit cards and went into more deep debt to get online just to, to start learning because I knew nothing about online business except, you know, websites and stuff like that. So I got to the program and it was hard and they really weren't great, but I figured out how to get clients without ads online. It's called organic marketing. And when they said, I said, I can't do ads, this won't work. And they said, no, you're right, it won't. I said, but that's what you're teaching. Yeah, you're going to have to do something called organic marketing. And I literally said, well, like carrots? <laughs> I didn't know what it was. They said, no, John, not like carrots. And I said, what is it? They said, go talk to people. I said, wait, that's the coaching? Go talk to people? They said, yeah. I said, okay, I can do that. I thought, that's all they're going to give me. I'm going to run with that. I know how to talk to people. That's what I'm good at. So... I figured out how to go online and talk to people and get them interested in getting on a, a call with me and getting clients. And then uh, it, it, it was eight weeks till I figured that out. It seems like not so long now, but when I was doing it, it was an eternity because the program was only 10 weeks. And I was like, if this does not work, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do because I don't want to plunk down another 10K if this doesn't work. On the eighth week, I got my first high ticket online client and I, we cried and danced around our home. Because I knew that that was the beginning and it was because I dialed in how to do this. And then I got two more that week. I got three clients in one week. It was the most money I'd ever made in one week in my life. 15K it was a 5K program at that point. And it was just me. And then the next month I made 30K. And I thought, oh my gosh, I just made 30K in one month. I mean, that was the most money I've ever made in a month in my life. And then I get to the next month, I made 40K. And then it kept going up and people were like, how are you doing this? And it just took off. People were like, I want to do it simply like you. And I started getting clients because they just wanted to work with me. And I built that on my own. I had like hardly any help to a million dollars in 17 months with a little bit of VA help. That was it. So that was, Impressive. you know, the the 30 year pathway to success you know, <laughs> that looked like it was, it was, it was and overnight, 17 yeah. months for sure with that, but we all know that what I learned before about grit, resilience, and all that, and I also was a coach, you know, it didn't just, but sincerely, the actual 17 months was learning how to get clients online. And then people were like, I want to, I want to figure out how, how did you do that? And they liked me because I was just really raw online. I was just posted from the heart. I just, I just posted whatever I wanted, <laughs> you know, like, you know, I, I just, they're like, oh, your, your copywriting could be better. I said, yeah, but it works. So I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's about being authentic. That's what I understood. Uh, and what was that? Or what did that organic marketing look like? Was it, was it just, um, content on, on it, was, it was just Facebook at first. So I got to a million right. dollars in groups or just on your, it was, in, so this is what it was. It was on my personal profile. It was in a bunch of groups. And it was in Messenger, you know, the conversations in Messenger. Yeah. And then later on, I started my own Facebook group. But I'll, I'll truthfully say that not a lot of the clients were coming from there, but I did start building that. But I, I was actually on Facebook. I became a master at Facebook. And then I integrated LinkedIn. And so the million was mostly Facebook and some LinkedIn. How regularly were you posting? Oh, well, I have a whole system. So my system was, uh, I'll tell you what I did. My system was when I first got on, nobody knew me on there. Like I was only on Facebook to mess with my friends in Australia and Canada. That was the only reason I never posted on Facebook. Mm. I didn't like Facebook and I hated social media. And I thought, okay, again, do whatever it takes. I thought, I don't care if I hate social media. I couldn't care less. I'm going to do whatever it takes. And that's kind of my thing. Do whatever it takes. 
So I don't go, oh, I don't like social media. So what? It's going to work. Do it. I like to sleep. So what? You can't sleep because I love sleeping. You're going to stay up every night till midnight, every night working. Sure. You know, I just do not what I want. I do what I want now, but I still do what works. I do what works. I still do what works now, by the way. So I thought, you know what? What's going to work? Part of me was like, oh, I don't like social media. I was like over that in like three seconds. So what? Do it anyway, Sean. I don't take time doing that thing. No more. I used to do that in my life. I don't do the going around and around the head. That's a sickness. Like, okay, so what? You got to do it. Okay, done. <laughs> Next. All right. Nobody knows what I'm doing here. That means I've got to like prime my profile. So I was posting two per day for the first week just to show everybody, hey, this, this is what I'm doing. People are like, wow, what are you doing? And I'm adding people that are more my avatar because I immediately figured out Well, after like the seventh week online, I figured out that coaches were my thing because coaches really need help and they resonated. And that's when I started getting the clients. So I hit my sweet spot, coaching all sorts of coaches and consultants and certain service providers. I just want to circle back to that time in in your life with the divorce because it sounded pretty, I mean, there's lots of, there's lots of words I could use. I mean, obviously, life changing in some intense, ways. That's for sure. What impact did that have on your business? Oh, I mean, I couldn't work properly. I kept it going, but we were moving from New York City to Ohio. Okay, and I, uh, my brother actually said to me, he said, I, I turned up. We stayed at their place for like five weeks, to like got things together, and he said, and then we had to go back to New York to get like the rest of the stuff like five weeks later. The second I was there, I was looking for chambers of commerce. And three days after I landed, I was at a meeting. So I didn't let it, I, I didn't like, I didn't let it slow me down, but it does slow you down because your mojo is interrupted. You're no longer where you were and you have to start a whole, nobody knew who I was there. And I was doing. What are you doing face to face as well in New York? Face to face coaching? Oh, never. Yeah. No, 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 no. Always by phone. Late, we only started doing Zoom during COVID, but face to face meeting people and and getting and they see me and like oh I see yeah I love you of course you know the highest resonance is meeting someone right and everybody goes oh I like doing that yeah but being online you can't do that and I've scaled not doing that but of course emotionally I'm exhausted we've been through all that me and the kids we're moving it's exhausting and and I have to give half of our stuff away because we had uh, literally I was given. 10 days to move, 10, to empty an apartment that we'd had for over 10 years. And I I was giving most of my stuff away to friends, furniture, everything, and packing what we did want to keep. It was just intense. My hands were swollen from the packing. Okay. Why did you have to move? Because we got kicked out of our home. Because I couldn't pay the rent. Yeah. So I couldn't pay the rent. And there's no way you're going to get an apartment with no money No, in New York City. Nobody was going to give me an apartment. So the judge said, sure, move. Great. So we did. And so it's not like I wasn't trying. I was really working very hard when I moved to Ohio. Very hard. But you're starting all over again. And you're always at a handicap when you have to start all over again because nobody knew who I was. And it's a new place and meeting new people. And who are you? And getting the kids sorted with all their activities and schooling and, and finding a place to live. So there's a lot of logistics as well. And eating and sleeping. You know, so I was doing my utmost and working really hard, but also just like saying to myself, I'm doing all I can. There is no more I could be doing offline. And that's when I thought, okay, I want to go online, but I just don't feel great to go online. Ah, kind of hiding. I'm kind of healing, you know, and I gave myself and then that, and then I realized, yeah, I'm not, I'm not myself. After two years, I became myself. I thought I'm back. Then I went online. I didn't want to go online sort of half-hearted, you know, like I knew it wouldn't work. Mm. You have to, you have to have some confidence, you know? So I got that back and yeah, that, that does set you back even though you're doing the, I wasn't taking a vacation. That's for sure. I was like, I got to make this work. So I still had, you know, the fire under me. I got to, I got to support these children. I don't, I I don't want to go. I was paying for stuff on credit, but you're not just like, oh, I'm just going to put her on credit for the rest of my life. You're trying to minimize the debt, right? I'm very responsible with debt. 
So that debt was the only time I've ever been in debt in my life, except for like, you know, $3,000 or two, right? Which you pay off. That was the most. And I, but I, I said to myself, you know what? This debt happened not out of irresponsibility. It happened because I had to pay for legal stuff and I had to do certain things. And I wasn't feeling up to, it took a lot of time too, a lot of distraction. How much was the debt in the end? Oh gosh, I, I'm not even sure, but I think it was around like 60K. Right. That's a lot for somebody, Which is a fast. lot for somebody yeah. that's not making hardly any money. What had stopped you going online with the first iteration of the business? Well, honestly, I wish that I'd had a coach that said, hey, we're just going to get you online and I didn't. Okay. So that was just, the coach I got was like the offline thing. And that's my one regret is that I didn't get online immediately. Okay. Also, I didn't, the whole techie thing scared me. I'm not techie. The funnels and I thought, oh, you know, actually, if I'd gotten online earlier, I would have made a ton more money. Like, I, I, you know, because I would have had all those years to learn it, right? But I was intimidated by it. I thought oh, the funnels and the ads and I don't know. And, you know, I just thought what I know is meeting people. So the one regret is, it was that I didn't get online sooner. If I had a regret, because I wouldn't have had to hustle so hard going off and having meetings and getting babysitters and all that. Because that was hard. Yeah, that doing was everything. Hard yeah, yeah, doing all the networking. That hustle I could have done without mm. the extra hustle. Truth be told. However, I, you know, Edith Piaf, je ne regrette rien. You know, I don't regret anything. I really have to live that way, don't you? you? You know what? You can't rewrite the past and we shouldn't want to because it is. It just is. And I think true forgiveness is giving up the idea of a better past. That's true forgiveness of others and ourselves. Is and I got that from one of my clients because she's a forgiveness coach, Jennifer Griggs. I'll plug her right here. By the way, she's a top world known oncologist as well, and she has a program about forgiveness. And she said that that oh my gosh, you're right. It's giving up. It's letting go of the idea of a better past because when we don't let go of the idea of a better past, what do we do? We try to make the past better and we can't do that in our minds. We can't make the past any different mm. than what it is and was. And when you let go of the idea of a better past, you're good. You've forgiven yourself and everybody. And that's what people struggle with is trying to rework in their mind to make the past better than it was. Like with family or, you know, some people that had a troubled relationship with a parent or, you know what I'm saying? Or any kind of relationship or loss of, you know, people I know and they lose their business, like they make a lot of money and then they lose it. They're forever, oh, I shouldn't have done that. If they just said, you know, I'm going to let go of the idea of a better past. I'm just going to accept that happened. I lost it. Move on. So for me, if 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 I did have a regret, if, if I could have done something different, I would have gotten online sooner, way sooner. So that's my mission is to help coaches get online sooner because I'll be doing them a huge favor because I've proven it many times. We've worked with over 420 coaches now. Would you say that that first business was uh, in some ways I would a say it was a success and then it failed out of circumstance because of life stuff happening I could not sustain doing the same level but just from a practical point of view because we only have a certain number and we're moving and going to the courts and and emotionally I kept it going as well as like I did have clients, but I was in such a state of extreme stress and anxiety that it was, I was just going through the motions. So because of a life circumstance, which happens to a lot of people, some people uh, have something happen in their lives, like they break up or they have a health issue or somebody else they lose, like they have a, a, a grievance, like if somebody dies and then they're in grief, that's a life thing that can definitely uh, cause a fail in a business. So this was a fail, but I didn't completely fail because I did keep the business going, but it's definitely stalled it because I just emotionally and physically just, I didn't have the same feeling about it because when you're in a state of dire stress and like survival, 
you're 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 lower on the, the you know Maslow scale. So it's not like yeah, I love my business. It's like I'm just keeping going while I while I sort this all out, right? So it failed from a personal rupture, I'd say, in my life, and it, 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 this happens. So I know I think it's important to say that we need to, you know, the serenity prayer about about controlling what you can. Knowing what you can control, knowing what you can't control, and being at peace that what you can't control, you have to let go. And that's kind of like what I was practicing. I thought, look, I, I did what I could. I think I did a good job. I did a really good job. And I, I wasn't down on myself. It wasn't about that. It was just, I was just PTSD from all the stress and trauma. And, but I did a good job. I did what I could. And, and what happened, happened wasn't bad. It was good we moved, actually. We were there for COVID. So, you know, sometimes you don't understand why something happens. And then in the longer arc of the story, it's like, oh, we got out of, we escaped from New York to be out of there for COVID. I was so grateful. That was a little long. That was, that was further on. Okay. I'd already been, we'd already been out for mm. two years or so. Okay. So all in all, you know, I have this saying, even when I lose, I win. That's my motto in my life. Even when I lose, I win. Because I think I'm losing sometimes. But when the, the it plays out, I'm like, wait, actually, I wasn't letting the story arc play out. The arc, the, the arc of the story was this long. If I'd kept going, ah, got it. That's what happened. And sometimes we do that in life. It's like in the immediate, oh, it looks like this is bad, right? But then it keeps going. You're like, oh, that actually was beneficial in the end, Right? So I've become more patient when something happens that I think might be bad. I'm like, wait, wait, Sean. Even when I, even when I win, even when I lose, I win. So, so that's just a, a way of looking at things. And I try to practice that when I think something's like bad. I'm like, wait a minute, hang on, hold your horses. Let's see how this plays out. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I think one thing I was sort of was was thinking was, if that divorce hadn't happened. Would you have gone I would have. online? I was actually ready to go online. And that happened right after I said to a friend of mine, I'm good. I made the 100K a year. I'm ready to go online now. I'm so confident. It happened literally within days of me announcing that to my friend, which was quite ironic, I thought. And then obviously you had, you had a, a setback that then yeah. delayed and getting life online. Funny. Life is funny. Years, I don't think it's worth saying what could have happened i don't even go there because i don't think it's helpful it just it just is it just is and in the end i won in the end what do i have to complain about i have a fantastic business i love my life I, i'm a huge success i'm helping so many people i'm getting a bigger vision for my life to, i'm getting a more bigger purpose now of helping more people not just coaches around the world and I'm developing that now and coming up with that massive transformational purpose. I'm in great health. I'm almost 59 years old. Okay. I'm in great health. I just hired a personal trainer. We eat fantastic food. We, we have a faith that we practice, which is important to us. We have friends and we're happy and my kids are in good schools and I have great clients. Why on earth wouldn't I be grateful? So all that that happened, I practice. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is letting go of a better past. It's all good because in the end, I'm good, right? And we sometimes get places because that was part of the divine plan. And I, I believe that this was the divine plan. Maybe stuff could have, wouldn't have, hood, I don't know. I'm not God. I'm just saying I'm grateful and I worked it all out. Thank God. <laughs> you know. And, you know, just go with that, right? And I'd be silly to say, oh, yeah, but I had so much pain on the way. Mm. Of course I did. Every successful person experienced a bunch of pain. And there is a correlation that the people that can sustain the most pain, sustain it and not let it crush them, often are the most successful people in this world. Because we're not letting the pain destroy us and bury us. It's like, I'm in a lot of pain and I will succeed and I will prevail. And they've done studies on that. The people that could sustain the pain and not be crushed by it, often are the most successful people. And they've been through stuff and have learned from it. So I'm not saying people that have been through a lot of pain and has crushed them, because that happens a lot in this life. And I have no judgment on that. My heart goes out to everybody in pain because 
my goal is to get people out of pain. I can't stand seeing people in pain, whether it's physical, emotional, uh, financial. I hate it. I'm like, oh, I just want to save you. You know, I want to help you. So it's about if you're going through pain, how can I use this pain? How can I learn from that pain? How can I not let it crush me? How can I make that part of my story? Like now that I'm telling people I had all this pain and hey, look where I am. You know how inspirational that is for people that I did that and I prevailed? They're like, well, I can do that too, Jean Amour. So that's kind of my mission is that no, I didn't just appear and it was all easy. It was really hard and it didn't just happen. I went through several iterations of my life and my business and you know, being an actress was really hard and being down and out in Paris was really hard and moving to another whole country is really hard and learning, you know, getting on Wall Street, well, it wasn't that hard, but you know, and, mm -hmm, and that was the easy bit. Then making it all work was hard and getting married and having kids and all that and then getting online and being poor again and, you know, living that life of, oh gosh, I got to just, it, it's just relentless sometimes. It was relentless and it went on for a long time. So it's not like Jean Amour got online and became a millionaire. That's not the story here. Jean Amour did a lot of different things, fails, ups, downs, failures, success, up and down. And then, you know, something finally worked. Other things had worked in my life. Like I was pretty good at that job. So it's not like I never succeeded in anything in my life. So it's really about just using your past to your advantage and getting the lesson out of that. And you failed. Great. What happened? Figure that out. Ah. Okay, well, next time I'll do this then. I'll learn something. And it's really important to try to have at all times, it's hard to have the best mood possible. And that's hard because I'm a complainer. You know, when things weren't working, I was like, oh, this is so hard. But it's really important to try to, it, positivity does, does move mountains. Just make the best of every day and be grateful. It's hard sometimes to be grateful when things are not working well. I know that. Or you just got to be grateful. I know, you know. But find one thing you're grateful for. You know, you ate today. Your kids are happy. You're all healthy. You know, you're not in deeper debt. Your parents love you. You know, you're doing what you want. It might not work right now, but there's good stuff happening. You know, and there's always somebody worse off. Always somebody worse off. Absolutely. I, I think gratitude um, journaling or, or just, you know, that simple technique of thinking of three things you're grateful for every day is, right. is, is such a simple habit um, and, and something that I do, but it's um, so powerful. And it's that great study and fact that apparently someone, they did a study on people doing that for 30 days and it had the same that effect as Pro Pro Prozac. I follow it. And I do that. I do his little... Yes. Right. Yes. Right. It is amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. So thinking about your two businesses, you, you had one which obviously achieved a level of success and as you said, uh, achieved 100K in revenue. And then you obviously had the second business which achieved a million in a very short space of time, 18 months, you said. And you know you could look at that and say, well, one was 10 times more successful than the other and, and I'm sure your current business has gone on to do more revenue than that. Yes. So you could, you could say that there was obviously quite a big difference um, between those two businesses right and i know uh, we were talking offline uh, about risk taking do you think there was a difference in your um approach and potentially your mindset around risk taking you took more risks in the second business compared to the the first a hundred percent because this is where i was it was all or nothing at that point it literally was all or nothing because there I was, I was 54 years old. I wake up one morning and think, wait, I'm 54 years old. That's not like 30 or 40, okay? Mm -hmm. And where am I? I'm a broke, single mom with two kids. And this isn't working. But this isn't working. That's clear. So I could continue to be, not in denial, because I wasn't in denial. But I could continue to just sort of like keep it going. I thought, I can't do this because I'm meant to be a success. That's what I know. I've been successful before at stuff. So I need to do something. What is that? And I thought the only way is if I just plunk down more credit, more debt and double down. Because if I don't get help now from people that know how to do online business, and I know there's a lot of coaches that do that, and I didn't know, and I was not going to be that person that cobbled things together and wasted my time. I had no time. 
So I'm not going to do that cobbling together and trying to figure stuff out that keeps you broke, poor, and behind. I thought I need to just double down, get the answers, because my talent is that I will pay for any bit of information if it's going to speed things up for me. So I'm that person is that coach knows something I don't know. I'm paying them because I'm not going to be just trying to save money and be cheap because I don't, I don't have time. I didn't have money either, but I had credit. You know, I had credit. I thought, well, I have credit. And this has to work now. This has to work right now. So I got to make this work. So it was all or nothing. It was just, this has to work. And if it doesn't work, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because then I'll be, uh-oh, well, that didn't work. Then it, would, then it would be that thing of getting another coach. And then it would be, I, I knew that that would be, if this didn't work, I thought, well, then I got to hire another coach. And then my, and I thought, I can't do that. This must work. So that was my mindset. This must work. And I had 10 weeks. Not a lot. 10 weeks. 10K. It's $1,000 a week, that program. I thought, this got to happen. So when I started doing it, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is really not working that well, I just doubled down. This, this has to work. And I did the work, and there was no thought in my brain that it could not work. I thought, it just has to work. So when you say to yourself, this has to work, your brain then says, you got to figure it out. And it wasn't working. Let's just face it. I didn't get online and everybody flocked to me and said, oh, jean Laurie, we love you. It's jean Laurie, don't know who the heck you are, Okay. Who's this old lady? <laughs> I mean, I'm not old, but I'm not like one of those 20 or 30 year old coaches. You know, I'm just there. And I know, let's face it. I had 900 conversations in Facebook Messenger and 18 sales calls in the first seven weeks. So I was working like a beast it, and I was creating content. When you look at my life then, it was taking the kids to, you know, their, 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 their school and then taking them from there to their singing and then, you know, in the car messaging people. And I was working in the day like maniac. I'm like, okay, I drop them off and I go, okay, I have like six hours, go for it. And I'm touching, I just work and I take like five minutes off for literally, oh, five minutes, go have something to eat, come back. It was highly structured again. Again, it's the same thing I did before. I've done that before. And I never said, oh, well, if this works, no, it was this has to work. See the very different mindset of people that go, well, let's see what happens. No, we're not going to see what happens. It has to work. Do you think that's a different mindset to what you had in the in the first iteration of the business? The first iteration was the first iteration. So I'm going to do what I do, but I wasn't the second round and I was older now. And we were now in deep, I wasn't in deep debt then. I was not in deep debt. I wasn't in debt at all. I was just using my credit card when I needed it. And I went into a little bit of debt to pay that coach, sure. But it was like, okay, I'm going to pay the coach, you know, 8K. And I'm sure, and I, I, I got clients and, and we off, you know, and I paid it back. So I was just in that normal everyday credit card debt that you pay off. I had like $3,000 debt. It was not stressful to me. And it was all on 0% cards because I managed my debt really well and never paid interest ever. So I was good. I was really smart about that. Very different being in deep, deep, deep debt having to move two years. I was like older, feeling like I'm a failure. Like, oh my gosh. But there was a little mind space in my head in the back thought. Little voice was like, yeah, but you were supposed to be that million dollar coach. Like little somewhere. If somebody had heard me say that, they'd think I'm crazy. But you? I thought, but I'm meant to be successful, you know? So I was working like a maniac, creating content, getting in groups. It was a lot of work. And see, I will do the work. I will do that. And I say now, there's two types of people for me, two, when it comes to business. There's the type that gets clear on what they want, okay? They know what they want. They, but I ask, what do you want? Oh, I want this. I want a million dollars. I want, yeah, I love it. It's so fun, right? You get clear. Now, the difference is this. There's the one type that says what they want. They want all this stuff. But they are not prepared to do what it takes to get that huge gap in mindset and it's not going to work. And they're left in a life of a limbo because they're stating they want this stuff. I want it, but they're never going to do what it takes because it's too hard. It costs too much money. They're not willing to risk anything. Now, I risked a lot. 
I'm up to risk another 10K on top when you're already in debt. Nobody does that. It's like, I'm in debt. No, I thought, so what? I'm in debt. I'm going to bet on myself again because I believe in myself at least a little. Do I believe in myself at least a little? Well, I have to, or otherwise I just, I don't know, go on social security again. So I did the work and I did what it took and I just kept, I kept understanding, oh, I need to do more. I need to do more of that. Okay, I need to do more conversations. And 900 conversations in seven weeks, that's a lot. Or eight weeks. Nice. 18 sales calls trying to figure out who my market was. Those were just research for me. But that's just you doing the numbers again, like you did when you were executive um, recruiter, right? Exactly. And I didn't even think of it that way. I just did it naturally. Like, just do the numbers. You're right. I was doing the same thing. So it really is about numbers and volume and, and, and research. And I, by the time I've talked to that many people... A lot of market research organically done. And on those sales calls, I thought, I know exactly what I'm selling now and what will sell. And I know what I'm doing now. And they're going to say yes. But it wasn't like, oh, I got an offer. I hope they say yes. It was all of that process. So when I got my first client and the guy says to me, do you have any, do you have any testimonials for this particular offer? I said, no, I don't. He said, wait, you're not going to lie and pretend. I said, of course not. I'm never going to do that. Nope. Never done this before. Of course, I've coached for eight years so far. I'm really good at what I do, but this is a new offer online and I figured this out myself. And he go, and I said, I've had seven times. You're the 18 sales call. He's like, wait, he goes, you booked 18 sales. I said, he goes, well, then you know. I said, I know that part. He goes, that's the hard part. I said, yeah, right. And I've had 900 conversations. He's like, oh, wow. So it wasn't, he realized the process and he goes, wow, mm -hmm. I'm so impressed that you didn't lie and make up some fake testimonial. I said, never. So he talked to his wife and he says, we are so impressed that you were just so truthful about like mm -hmm. process and everything that I'm going to hire you. I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> and he came into the first call. Yes, it was, it was being at the, it, you know what it was? It was being at the roulette wheel and doubling down. That was what this was. It was risk. It is risk. And risk is always a gamble because we don't know how things are going to turn out. I just said to myself, this must work because if it doesn't, what am I going to do at that point? I'd be demoralized. I knew I had to get online. I thought, okay, this is going to work because, oh gosh, I was so happy when it did work. <laughs> I can't tell you. I was just like so happy and grateful. I thought, hey, this worked. And I, and I could see I was onto something. You know, I thought I knew it in my, I thought I cracked the code. And then of course people were like, I want to work with you. And it, it was just, and then a few months later, COVID started. Now, if I had not risked, mm. I would have been, I, w I would have been in such deep debt after COVID because if I were offline, there was nothing going on, right? Mm -hmm. I was so grateful that I risked because it was meant to be. That was the divine plan. That's what I call it, the divine providence because I was positioned online for a few months already being a success that people were then like, oh my gosh, I need Jean Amlor because I need to get my business online. And do you think that first iteration of the business and I know we, we also talked about, or you, you were talking about how some entrepreneurs get held back or they get impacted by a personal circumstance that, that happens in their life. Now, you you could argue, and uh, one of my favorite business books is The E-Myth, and he talks about essentially where a person has a job they leave a job and they start a business but actually they haven't got the structures in place around that business and all they've done is created another job for themselves i read that book funnily enough when it came it's out. an amazing book and and ago. there was that book where he said that you know if you have a pie you know if you can make the best pies in the world but you don't know how to market it and nobody cares is that the book yeah he talks about um how you know not everyone should be an entrepreneur just because you just because that. you're a good hairdresser or you're a good baker or you're a good plumber doesn't mean you should start a business around around those um I agree. those concepts i love the book. i actually remembered that because i've made millions of books and i remember that book because of that. yeah it's a it's a very well written book because he obviously uses the story of the the baker and um, to illustrate his point for me the the question is and i i think this can be, you know, deemed a, a, a failure of of structure in some ways where entrepreneurs have set up a business, but it's so dependent on them that if something happens in their personal life, then the whole business collapses because it's just them. 
and there isn't any other framework or structure around them and that's the whole point of his book is actually putting for structures so you can step out of business so you can have a holiday so you can be ill mm-hmm. do you think your first business suffered from that a hundred percent yes a hundred percent i did have coaches working for me at that point by the way i had a coaching team but i had to yeah. i had to dissolve it because i couldn't i wasn't i couldn't market i just what i was stressed out i couldn't I didn't have the bandwidth to then keep, so I, I let the team go. I had like a, like a Tony Robbins kind of team where it was me and then. Yeah. You know, but I, 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 my, my, my coaches were like, "Oh, we totally get it. You're going through all this." And I said, "I, I just, I said to them, I said I can't deal with this anymore. I just have to have me coach." So I got rid of that because it was management. Um, the fact is, most coaches, unless you're like a McDonald's coaching company, I call it the McDonald's coaching company, where the coach can take off weeks. You, most coaches can't do that. No, I have a team now. So if I did need to go on vacation, certainly my head coach could take that. However, people are coaching with me because they want me. And it's fine for a week while Jean Amour goes on vacation. They're not going to be worried. But if I go on vacation and it's just my coaching team where they're like, wait a minute, we signed up because we want you. So Mm -hmm. there is, you know what I mean? So there's varying degrees of that. But for a coach who turns up, as I said, sure, I, I could I could go away. I've got a coaching team. But my clients won't like that long term. They're under mm-hmm. sure. He'll he's great. Sure, he's gonna take that. Absolutely. But if I just disappeared, well, well that's not what we signed up. We signed up because we want you. It's your mm-hmm. your team's helping you. But I certainly do have a team now, so I'm not doing it all. And and it's it's serving the clients better. Because it's not all about me. In my in my knowledge, I have a, like a mindset coach that does healing. I don't do that. Um, I do mindset. I don't do what she does. I have a, a wonderful, actually British heart-based sales coach. I have a wonderful content and copy coach who used to run, you know, Universal Studios video content department. I don't do that. So it's good I have the team. But I think it really depends on the kind of business. But certainly for other businesses, absolutely 100%. Those businesses really need to have the goal of taking themselves out of the equation. Mm. Coaching and consulting are a little different because if you're a consultant, you say, well, oh, you hired me, but I'm going to have my, my, they're not going to like that, right? So some of it is unavoidable if you're a coach or consultant. And that's obviously a limitation of the business model, isn't it? It's a limitation of the type, yes, not just the business, but the model, the type of business it is. It's not just the model of the type of business because there's, coaching business models where they have taken themselves out of the equation. Mm. However, I don't want to be that kind of a business with this because they're signing up because of me. And then I've heard people complain, you know what? I signed up for that coach and I never saw him or he was just the team and they, they complain about it. So I don't want to be somebody that some people complain about because we're saying it's mine and then I don't turn up. Uh, not good. Or, I had somebody that said that she, a very famous person, I won't mention, I like him a lot, I'm not going to mention the name. I said, that's really great. You're going to see him. She goes, no, John. It was called uh, in person and group. He turned up once in the whole time for a few minutes to be able to fulfill that they said that. Mm-hmm. She goes, we didn't see him at all. In fact, it was like all digital and we had to do it on our own. And then we got like this one session because he just turned up to, so she said that wasn't good because they felt misled actually. Yeah. So you can do coaching without turning up if it's delivering digital products that people know it's work at your own pace. That's a very fine model. It's just not the model I have because people want to get me and they want me to be there coaching, actually coaching, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's, a, that's an interesting distinction. And, and as you said, I think that is just the nature of, of, of coaching compared to kind of, uh, you know, other kind of products. So just kind of wrapping up, looking back at that fear that you mentioned at the beginning and that was obviously so intense, what advice would you give to new entrepreneurs who are just starting out about how to overcome the fear of failure? I would say worse stuff can happen. You know, like, 
it's like we take ourselves so seriously. I mean, what if I fail? Well, what if you do fail? What does that look like? You know, ask the question. What what does that look like? Is it the worst thing in the whole world if you fail? A lot of people fail the first business and they they do another one. It, why? If it's you're going to fail and your kids won't eat, sure that's that you know. But if it's oh I'm so afraid of failing, but I'm single and I'm not really going to ruin my life. That's I might have a bit of debt. You know, look at what are the repercussions of that fail. Now seriously, if you are needing to make the business to feed your family, that's like oh boy, there's a lot more at stake. Would we agree on that? Then if there's some single guy or girl that's really young and if they fail, oh, well, they failed, they can do something else, right? So look at how will that impact your life if you do fail and see how big how big is that, right? That's important. It's an important point, actually. Um, well, then just do it anyway. Just just do it because all of that mind stuff of what if I fail, blah, 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 it's just mind trash. It's not going to get you any. All of this stuff Somehow, human beings think that the more they think, that they're going to get value out of that. They're not. They're just like doing a number on their brain, right? It's not helpful. So figure out what is helpful. Is going around and around and around with the worry, is that helping? No, you're, you're creating the rut in your brain of overthinking, which people think is a good thing. No, it's not. Overthinking is a disease. It's monkey mind. It is not good to check into your so-called intuition, which is not intuition sometimes. It's your fear it's created such a neural rut that people actually think that's their intuition. It's not. It's not their intuition. And we've got to figure out what's the difference between gut feeling and intuition and mistaking fear and overthinking as intuition because it's not. So when somebody says to me, oh, my intuition says I'm thinking, nope, it's fear. My intuition says I shouldn't invest in my business. Really? No, that is definitely not intuitive. It's not intuitive. Do not invest in a business because we all know the first rule of business is that you must invest in a business to make it grow. You cannot have a business that you're not investing something in, whether that's in coaching or buying products or expertise or something, it won't grow. So if you have this fear of failure so much that you're just stuck, well, I'm going to do the business and it's all just what I can put into it, you will fail. You will fail. You don't get help. You don't buy stuff, you don't invest in something, some systems or something, you're going to fail. So the fear of failure can actually make you fail. That's my, my two bits. Mm -hmm. Fear of failure makes people fail. They're so afraid of failing. What if you just said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make this business work. I'm going to figure out the who. Who do I get to help me? It's usually a who and not a what. Then the who tells you the what. Okay? It's way more about Dr. Benjamin Hardy wrote a book about that called The Who, Not What, I think. I have it. So it is, it's not about waking up in the morning and just overthinking and then, you know, you do your overthink, worry, I'm going to fail. You don't do much. And then this is hell. This is living in hell to me of that kind of thing. So I would say, get clear. Do you want the business? Yes or no? Yeah, I do. How much do you want the business? Scale of one to 10. 10, great. Five, you don't want the business. That's a win and it's neutral. So if somebody asks themselves, how much, how much do I want this business? And the answer is a five, give it up. A neutral will never move you to do anything important in life. Okay? You got to be at a good eight or nine, minimum eight of motivation to actually motivate yourself. If you're not there, it's not going to happen because any little road bump, you're going to give up. You get a little tiny road bump, and you're a seven or an eight. Ah, you're a six or a five. Forget it. That's a win. Okay. Now it's interesting. I was on a sale. I'm on many sales calls and I was on a call with somebody. And I asked her, what do you want from this coaching business? And she said, oh, I want to make a million dollars. I said, awesome. I love it. I love big goals. I love helping people get, you know, what I got. I said, that's fantastic. And then, you know, we talked a bit more and I said, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how much do you want to make a million dollars with this business? And she went, oh, you know, I'm a five. I said, oh, a five is neutral. So whether it happens or not makes no difference to you. She went, yeah. She goes, if, if I make a million dollars, I'll take it. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, we can't work to him. Yeah. I said, because millions of dollars, a million dollars does not drop on your head because you'll accept it. I think that God in the universe understands that we will accept that money. We're good, right? So saying, 
yeah, sure. If it happened to me, I would take it. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, for somebody to get to a million dollars in a business, that means they hustled and they worked very hard at many different things, depending on what the business is. It doesn't just happen. I said, we cannot work together. She goes, okay. So that's the problem. Stating you want something on a whim, but then not wanting to do it, give it up. Say, well, actually, I don't want the million. I don't really want it. What I really want is what? I said, what do you really want? Because, yeah, I just want to like work at my own pace. I said, great. So you don't want a million dollars. You want to work at your own pace and take whatever clients you can get. She said, yes. I said, that's what you want. That's it. Let's stick with that. She said, thank you. You clarified things for me. She thanked me. Okay. Because we're told we have to want a million dollars. We have to want this. Get clear on what you actually want. Ask yourself, scale of one to 10, what is it? It's not a 10 or a nine. You probably won't be able to sustain that because you need to be passionate and all in. You need to be all in. They ask, am I all in? Yeah, I'm all in. Okay, good. Got it. If you're not all in, question your choice. Well, why is it because I think it's going to be cool? Because it's not going to be easy. And at that point, it won't matter. Okay, I really want this. I'm at a 10. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Those people don't sit around asking if they're going to fail. I certainly didn't. It just has to happen. No way out. Got to happen. When you have no way out, what do you do? You figure something out. <laughs> when you're painted into a corner, what do you do? You crawl up the wall, right? I just thought of that. What would you do if you're painted into a corner? You got to do something. You got to climb up the wall and be Spider-Man and get back. <laughs> you figure something out. You have somebody, you say, hey, you throw me some suction cups. I'm going to be a Spider-Man. You would do something. You figure it out, right? Nobody talks about what to do when you're painted into a corner. I just found a solution. So you either do it, you want it or not, and you have to take risk. You have to take risk. There is some risk. There's risk of time. There's risk of your reputation that your family might see you fail. There's risk of looking like an idiot. There's risk of not knowing what you're doing. And there is risk of monetary risk investing. That is real. If you want to get away with that, you won't. <laughs> you won't. Mm. It won't happen. No, it's, there's some such good advice there. Um, completely uh, agree um, with that. And yeah, I think you're right. The that fear of failure can can ultimately mean that people fail because they're not they're not taking enough risk or it's it's holding them back. And you know that it's that mindset is is hindering them. So, final question: If you could go back in time and erase that first business closing and your divorce and all of the impacts around that from happening would you do that actually the business was the same business i carried it on it was just a second iteration that had to happen it's sort of like a volcano exploding it had to happen it had to happen to get me where i am now because it would have been a half kind of thing going on it the rupture had to happen it didn't have to be how it was but it was what it was. And given the personalities involved, that was always going to happen in not a good way. That's all I'm going to say. So it had to happen. And funnily enough, as I said, it got me out of New York because I I wouldn't have wanted to be in New York during COVID with two kids. That would have been horrible. Yeah. So there were benefits of the rupture. And what doesn't make you, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger until if you can handle it, some people, what, what doesn't kill them does almost kill them. They get demoralized, you know, for certain personalities, what doesn't kill you does make you stronger. And I'm going to say something really weird. We need to learn how to be cockroaches. We need to learn how to be anti-fragile. You know that book, Anti-Fragile? Mm. It's amazing. We need to learn to step into the highest iOS that our brain can do and stop being whinges. Because stuff's going to happen in this world very soon with AI. And we, we're going to have to be like, we need to be as gritty as we can. And we need to stop making excuses. We need to stop complaining. And we got to say, okay, how can I be, you know, not superhuman, but just not go into the mediocre, kind of like mediocre everyday person kind of thing, right? And being anti-fragile is, how can I be 
anti-fragile. Now, something can't become anti-fragile without some stress on it. You become anti-fragile from the stressors. That makes sense. So, mm. like, I'm I, I hired a personal trainer recently because I'm like I want to get in tip-top shape, and oh my gosh, the, the stuff that we're doing, I'm already feeling that I didn't have enough stress on my muscles. I want I need the stress to be able to develop to 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 get stronger. Actually, yeah, you yeah. Know, sitting around babying myself is it making me stronger physically? And I think that's a really good place to to sort of end, in, you know, in saying that you need the the setbacks and you need the the stresses along the way in in both a business sense and a personal sense in order to get stronger, to be grittier and more resilient. Right. Exactly. And nobody wants to hear that. They want to baby themselves. But a fact is, a human body gets stronger by the stress, by by doing the hard stuff. Sitting around on a comfy chair makes us weaker. It's the same for everything in our lives. I think it's a good analogy, actually. Well, there's that great quote that I, I really like, which, which is like, growth happens outside of the comfort zone. And... Right. Well, that's exactly where it happens. So just wrapping up, we always end on a quick fire round. So this is short questions and short answers. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to crack on. Failure is? Necessary. What's your life's mission? To help 100 million people to thrive. What's one piece of advice that you would want to give to other people on your deathbed? Stop caring what other people think about you. What's one habit that keeps you resilient? Eating well. If you could be immortal, would you take it? No. Why? Because I know in my place and I'm not immortal and I don't want to be something I'm not. What's one surprising fact that not many people know about you? Um. Oh, that's a hard one. Mm, that, oh, that I love anything to do with aviation and cars. Well, we've already talked about planes today, so. <laughs> yeah. And what's one guest that you could recommend that you think I should have on? Sophie McLean. Who's, who's Sophie? Really amazing spiritual, I don't want to say the word guru, but kind of is. Okay, I'll check um, Sophie out. So, Jeanne, um, where can people find you and connect with you? Well, I hope that we're giving you all all our stuff for the show notes, but they can find these all over social media uh, at www.jeanamlore.com. My name on Instagram, Jeanamlore, LinkedIn, Jeanamlore, Facebook, Jean all over the place. Also, I have a YouTube channel called Jeanamlore TV, and I have a podcast called Business Wealth Impact that we just launched. Amazing. Well, good luck with the podcast launch. I will put all of that in the show notes, of course. Thank you so much for, for being here and for your honesty and, and all of your insightful advice to everyone. And I, I know people are going to get a lot of value out of today's episode. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, it was a pleasure. This was a very intense and very well done interview. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.